Okay, so hopefully you can see the intro slide for my next presentation. Yes, it's there. Thanks. Perfect. Okay. So, um, as uh, as we said, this work was um, part of my PhD thesis, and so I'm uh, I, I'm with this slide just giving a little bit of credit back to the University of Saskatchewan that uh, helped support me throughout my PhD. There were many many people that were involved and and absolutely essential to bring off both aspects of these projects. This next one, especially because so much of it had to do with animals on the ground. But so we're gonna continue on the Seropthes vein here. And uh, as part of this project, we brought a number of wild bighorns from that Seropthes affected population into a captive research pen for a period of just over a year, while we looked to see whether there was any sort of treatments that were maybe wildlife appropriate. And so there were a huge, huge number of people that helped sustain that wild population in these captive pens during that time, uh, checked on them daily, fed them daily, and then came to help with our handling of them. Um, and I, I definitely couldn't get through thanking all of them enough. So a little outline for the second presentation, I'll give you, I've already given you a background on Seropthes. Um, I'll talk a little bit about the objectives of this trial specifically, how we went about doing this treatment trial and then some of the opportunities that I hope that it might help facilitate in the future. So moving forward, Seropthes and bighorn sheep. So for anyone that's uh, familiar with sheep scab or what Seropthes causes in domestic sheep, it causes a quite nasty generalized mange. In bighorn sheep, like rabbits, it tends to localize to their ears. So the animal that you can see there is one of the affected, sort of a typically affected bighorn sheep in the Okanagan area. The one on the right, the small ear picture is another animal that is just from the other side of that valley where I mentioned they don't have Seropthes in the Okanagan. And then of course, a beautiful stock photo of a nice looking ram with normal looking ears. I do wanna mention in some cases it can get quite nasty. I've seen certainly some really awful pictures from Hell's Canyon and this particular animal being the index case where the parasite was confirmed in the Okanagan region, this ram was later euthanized in Olala soon after this photo was taken and the post-mortem exam was done by the wonderful folks at the Abbotsford Animal Health Lab in BC here and confirmed the presence of Seropthes in that population. So our trial here that I'm discussing is uh, an attempt to try and find a way that we could treat bighorn sheep in a way that is functional and potentially relevant for, um, for for wildlife and for bighorn sheep specifically. As I mentioned, the parasite was eradicated from Canadian population in the 1920s and from the American domestic sheep population in um, the 1970s. And that was done using multiple treatments with different antiparasitics, mainly macrocytic lactones. And that isn't necessarily functional or relevant for wildlife because obviously you can't plan to do multiple treatments. You can't treat them every two weeks or something like that. In a, in a realistic way, the way you can with domestic sheep. Um, and many of the drugs that were originally used for some of those eradication attempts are no longer allowed to be used because of larger impacts on the animals or, or human safety factors associated with those drugs. So our goal here was to find a drug that worked after a single application. Um, and then also ideally to see whether that drug could provide some duration of protection from reinfection. Um, while we could attempt to treat an entire herd, for example. And that's one of the major challenges with this parasite is that the animals don't develop any degree of immunity. And so even if you treat an animal successfully, they can become reinfected very easily by just intermingling with other animals in the population, which is why the multiple treatments were necessary with previously used drugs. So, oh, there we go. Um, so this is my slide on conducting a treatment trial on wildlife in five easy steps. I have no doubt I'm preaching to the choir here. You guys are all very familiar with how challenging it is to work on both captive and free ranging wild sheep. Um, my step one here is to recruit an army of volunteers. It took so many people to pull this off and, and it would have absolutely not been possible without so many eager people that were interested in helping. Um, the photo on the top there is the Penticton Indian Band, which is where we built the enclosures. And we had a huge, great deal of help from the Penticton Indian Band biologists and 
and many of their community members in checking on the animals and feeding the animals and doing our handling and sampling periods. Um, and then the lower picture is just preparing for one of the sampling days. And we had a variety of people from the Penticton Indian Band, as well as local hunters and, and many students, and of course, the fish and wildlife biologists that were essential throughout all steps. Step two was to design and build some research pens. It uh, obviously took a bit of work to get that off the ground, but it was great to be able to do this work right locally and not threaten to spread this parasite anywhere else. We literally built the research pens with the sheep watching us. And so it was not a large translocation to move them from outside the pens to inside. And when the trial finished, we could literally just open up the fence and let them back into their home terrain. And that was pretty amazing to see. So it took a lot of volunteer time again to build those research pens. Then of course we had to go and catch our naturally infested bighorn sheep. And as many of you know, that's often more difficult than you might hope it would be. And then step four was to treat them. And step five was to follow up. And we had large numbers of people helping with each of our follow-up events so that we could handle the animals as quickly as possible and shorten the duration that they were experiencing the stress of being handled. All of those handling events were done without the aid of any sort of chemical immobilization or sedative. Um, we just blindfolded and hobbled them. And so we had a huge number of people that were helping just get that work done as, as quickly and efficiently as possible. And it was amazing to see how many people were excited and willing volunteers throughout. So our study design, we were looking at a drug called Long Range, which is a long acting aprinomectin solution that is marketed for cattle and advertises 150 days of parasite prevention. And so we figured that's great. That might help us be able to treat the animals and then have some period of time when we could potentially treat an entire population before they become reinfested. So we captured 18 animals to be divided into three treatment groups, six animals per group. We had one pen that was deemed our treatment pen here, you can see on the left, and one pen that was our control pen on, or I guess on the right, and then on the left is our control pen. And then we had a third group that was our treatment challenge group that we would treat. And then once they were cleared of disease, we would move them over into the control pen and then monitor how long it took before they were redeveloping active signs of infestation. We were handling the animals monthly for six months and then we're gonna do a final follow-up at one year before releasing the animals. And we were collecting a, a number of different health parameters and sampling metrics, including ear lesion scores and live mite presence, which I think are some of the most indicative of the severity and active status of the infestation. And so those are the ones we'll talk about today. To give you an idea of it, uh, the ear lesion scores, they were graded on a four point scale that was previously described in a, in a rabbit infestation paper, because like I said, the bighorns um, exhibit a primarily ear infestation pattern like rabbits do. And the severity of infestation was based on how much of the ear was affected with zero being none of the ear, one being only in the ear canal, two being the bottom third, three being the the bottom two thirds and then four being the entire ear pinna being affected. So at the time of treatment, all of the animals were heavily infested and heavily symptomatic. I should note that when we captured the animals, every animal we captured was heavily symptomatic in the ears. So there weren't any animals that needed to be discluded because of not being um, heavily infested enough. One month after treatment, unfortunately they were all still affected. So that was pretty disappointing. We gave it another couple months and found that none of them were completely cleared of their infestations. And so at that 90 day mark, we figured we would treat them again and see whether we could appreciate any, any improved effect. We did have one animal die in a way that we don't expect was related to treatment at all, especially given that it was a control animal. So it was only injected with saline. Um, and of course our second treatment didn't have any effect at all. So that was highly disappointing. This is the ear lesion scores that we found over that time period. And so you can see that some of the ear lesion severity seemed to decline a little bit, but it's, I, I guess the long and short of it is that all of the animals continued to have lots of live mites present in their ears. And even the animals that improved still had primarily two to three out of four ear lesion severity. So they were all still heavily symptomatic. And as we know, they're not developing any immunity to this parasite. And so they're, they're just gonna become reinfected. 
infested again. Um, and so essentially the long range was considered to be a failure. So we put all this work in, we recruited all these volunteers, we built these research pens, what now? Luckily for me, um, I was talking to a pharmacologist at the University of Saskatchewan, Dr. Dr. Trisha Dowling, and she suggested that Fluoralanor, a uh, drug marketed under the brand name Brevecto, had been doing some pretty amazing things with a number of different mite species in dogs and cats. Um, and there are also papers in other, in other species as well. And she was like, it would be really great if you could get that into some bighorn sheep and see how that worked. It took a little bit of extra work and, and prodding, but ultimately we did manage to convince our committee to let us do that. And um, so I swapped around our pens. I took the animals that were initially in our control pens. At this point, there were nine animals because they had had their lambs. And we divided those into four different treatment groups that you can see here, a low dose oral, a high dose oral, which are the oral form is the dog form of Brevecto and then a low dose topical and a high dose topical, which is the cat form of Brevecto. And then we took all of the animals that were previously treated with our long range and we made those our control animals so that there wasn't any suspicion of uh, the synergistic effects potentially of the two drugs or something like that. We followed up for about three months because like I said, we wanted to be releasing those animals at the one year point and we used the same sampling protocols. So this, um, table isn't my most intuitive, but basically what it's showing is within each category, how many animals had live mites in both ears, how many had live mites in one of their two ears, and how many li had live mites in none of their two ears. So you can see here that our orally treated animals in both groups had no live mites in either ear, while, while our topically treated animals continued to have live mites present in both ears, and our no treatment group had live mites mostly in both ears with a few animals being in one ear, although I'm suspicious about insufficient sample collection for those ones. And our sample collection protocols became more rigorous after that point. And so you can see that those control animals continued to be heavily infested. Over the following two months after that, we continued to see significantly improved clinical signs and sometimes no live mites in some of the ears. So they're definitely becoming reinfested. At that point, it became very difficult for us to know whether we were seeing mites that jumped over from the topically infested, topically treated and still infested animals that were co-housed with our orally treated animals. So it's possible that we are seeing some of these mites being ones that had jumped over and might still succumb to the residual effects of the oral fluoralanor versus re invigoration of a, of a true infestation. So that's something that our study protocol is simply not able to pull out. We really um, viewed this as a, as a pilot study and, and so a proof of concept, hopefully that at least the oral fluoralanor is probably worthy of additional investigation. This is a graph of the change in our ear, ear lesion severity. And you can see these two lines here being our um, low oral and our high oral dosages, and then our control and um, topical treated dosages uh, topically treated groups still having severe ear lesions. To give you an idea of one of the characteristic orally treated animals, how their ears changed over the course of four months, that's at the day of treatment, one month later, two months later, and three months later of the same individual in the same ear. So as we prepared for release, we figured the least we could do is try and treat all the animals that we had and hopefully add a little bit more sample size to our small sample size that we had for our pilot study. So we treated all of the remaining animals with the oral fluoralanor that was used at the highest dosage. And we found no live mites in any of those animals prior to release one month later. And their ear lesions dramatically improved over the course of that month. There's a little bit of subjectivity that has to be involved in the ear lesion severity because we're seeing sign of improvement, but with the amount of scarring and damage to the ear, they simply couldn't return to an entirely normal ear within the period of a month with that hair growth and all of that, but, um, but dramatically improved for sure. So in conclusion, uh, fluoralanor is a good treatment option when given orally, but there are many more questions that need to be answered before it can be really used in a functional way in wildlife such as what are, how can we um, broaden our delivery options, maybe put it in a baited feed or a medicated salt lick or that sort of thing. 
we need to do some studies on what the toxicity and safety of the drug might be before we might do some sort of free choice um, feeding of the drug. We need to further clarify the questions about the duration of protection um, and, and gain a better understanding of whether treatment in wildlife is feasible. And it might be one of those things where some populations are simply too inaccessible while other ones are small and maybe easier to bring into some sort of handling facility while they all got treated and confirmed to be free of disease. Of course, there's always the question, is it worthwhile? Is the disease having a significant enough impact on a particular population that, uh, that we think it's worth doing some sort of treatment approach for this parasite? Um, is it safe in a hunted population? What are some of the effects on non-target species or other ecosystem effects? And, uh, but before we could answer all these questions, we needed to make good on our promise to all of the stakeholders and to the First Nations community that were involved in this, that uh, we would let these animals go and not turn them into lifelong research animals. So I had a great little video of us letting them go, but because of the Zoom complications, that doesn't work. Um, but I do have a cool little video that I can maybe put into the chat here um, that just demonstrates some of the ways that we handled them and a really amazing little macro um, video of the uh, of what their ears looked like while they were infested. So I'll just copy that into the chat here. Um, if you want to see it, go check it out. And while that's happening, I'll be happy to thank my so many volunteers and many different supports and organizations that helped bring this about and take any questions. Thank you, Adam. Your timing is fabulous. Um, so we do have a question here from Peregrine Wolf about what is the withdrawal period of uh, Bravo to Bravo in food animals? Perfecto. Yeah, it's a great question. Um, so, so that's one of the things that we just don't have. We don't have a withdrawal period for Brevecto in food animals. Um, I do know, and, and I've reached out to um, the company that produces the drug to see whether there are any aspirations to create a livestock version of this drug. And I think the poten potential definitely exists. And especially with the implications of something like Seropdes in domestic sheep in the UK, I can't imagine that they're not going to go there sometime, but uh, we simply don't have the studies yet. I can say that there is a commercially available form of the drug in, I want to say South Africa or Australia for chickens. And so there might be some preliminary data on its safety in food animals from those species, but the crossover into a species like bighorn sheep, I think makes it too big a extrapolation, but um, contacting some pharmacologists about that would be the next step. Um, and, and I think that's one of the important questions that needs to be answered if you're potentially gonna use this drug in a potentially hunted population. Of course, if a population is, is dying off so much that you're that you're potentially considering a real wide scale application in a in a wild population i would imagine that's probably not a population that's being hunted but um i think there's also appetite to use this when handling an animal in hell's canyon for example with really severe symptoms and if if that's in an area where they're hunted i'm not sure what the hunting regulations are in some of those places then of course that limits our ability to use something like that great thank you um, we have another question here from Francis. Do you think there is a Seropti species specific response to the drug? So rabbit versus sheep scabies. Uh, I'm not sure if I totally understand the question. I think it's asking, would this work in rabbits as well? And I expect that that would be the case. I'm going, um, to, um, I'm going to allow Francis to talk to explain. Francis, sorry. Do you want... Hey, Adam. Hey, no, Francis. I just... I was just wondering if the tick response to the, I mean, the, the Seropdes response itself, like if- Like, do I think that it might be different in the rabbit variant versus the yeah. usual bighorn variant? Yeah, that was the question. I see. Um, I, I simply haven't used it in, in um, bighorns outside of this particular trial. I expect that it would probably work quite well, given the fact that this drug has been doing some pretty amazing things. Um, I've seen papers on its use in for treating sarcoptic mange in dogs and in bears, and it's been um, quite quite remarkable what some of the results are. So I can't imagine the minor differences between the seropdes of bighorns and or traditionally found in bighorns and traditionally found in rabbits would be a dramatic difference. 
Great. Um, another question for you here from Lynn Martin. Uh, do you have a sense if the one-off treatment dose would clear a severe infection or only mild infestation? It, it's a little hard to say. I would say with the higher dosage that we are using, that 25 milligrams per kilogram of oral dosage, um, we had literally every single animal completely clear of mites um, from any of the samples collected at the time of release. And so I suspect that it would work for even more severe infestations. None of the animals that we had in our trial had very severe infestations. They all had pretty prominent ear infestations. And then numerous animals had some mild scabbing down their necks, but certainly nothing like that picture of that Olala ram that was heavily infested. So I think it would work, but I don't know for sure. Great, thank you. Um, I don't see any other questions here. I don't see any hands up. Going once, going twice. We're gone. Okay. Um, thank you, Adam, very much. That's been a really interesting story to watch over the years, and I think you made great progress in it. So, Thanks. so. I guess um, that is the end of our session. I want to thank all the speakers. We had um, a really interesting uh, set of speakers going from the Yukon and trying with their control order and trying to prevent all these problems with MOV, um, a very proactive approach. Kevin with a case study using temporal and spatial data to try to understand more the transmission dynamics and ecology. And Robert looking at juvenile survival, genetic diversity, and um, interestingly, how a road stopped the disease spread in a way. Um, Brianna looking at, uh, with a slightly uplifting presentation um, that demonstrated differences in the epidemiology presentation of MBOV and then uh, Kylie with her drivers of recovery and uh, exploring that a bit further. Then we moved up to, into Canada to find out what uh, people do when they're not dealing with pneumonia outbreaks and uh, with this data deficient species. Um, nice presentation by Kylie to, to fill in a lot of those knowledge gaps for thin horn sheep and then followed by Adam with his great story about seropathies and what's going on there. So with that, I think I turn it over to you, Kevin.